How many young people do we have in the, in, in the church today? If you're under, say, 16, raise your hand. So we've got 16. If you're under 16, raise your hand. All right. Now, if you're in that group, every time I say great controversy today in my little sermon, mark it down somewhere. We're gonna, I want you guys to keep a tally. And everybody else, I want you to get up right now, and for about the next minute, 30 seconds to a minute, I want some of you to go shake hands, greet someone around you. If there's visitors in this church, introduce yourself. Get up. Happy Sabbath, thank you. Happy New Year, you do. Okay, everybody, start finding your seats. I, maybe. If everyone can start finding a place to sit down. I didn't want to create a social hour. I wanted some greeting. No, it does not. All right, everyone, take your bulletin, okay? The invocation, Bill Jeffries didn't do that, Dennis Everts did that, so you can put that in there if you want to. The scripture lessons was not Romans 7, 18, though I will use that. It was 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. And uh, see, everything else is in place. And the Sabbath message is not forgiven. It doesn't have a title, so leave it blank. Billy called me on Thursday, and he said he wasn't feeling good, so make sure that maybe thought about getting something together. So I called John and said, John, are you on the platform on Thursday? And he goes, I don't think so. I said, okay. So he called me. Yesterday evening, what time was it, about 6.30 or so? I'm eating supper, I'm over at my sister's house. You're right, Dennis, I'm on the platform. I said, well, you might think about, you know, you know, whatever you need to do, do it. Ever since Bill's been head elder, there's a sheet of paper that we have with elders um, schedule. And the bottom that says, the very last thing that says, if you're on the platform and your speaker doesn't show up, be prepared to do a sermon. So I got here this morning and uh, said hi to John and everything. And at, by the time John called me last night, I knew Bill wasn't going to be here, but I wasn't going to say, John, do you have a sermon ready? It's 6.30 Friday night. You might want to think about it. I wasn't going to do that to him. So anyway, when he called last night, I answered the phone. I told him, yeah, yep, you are. Okay, fine. So everything goes fine, and we go back uh, a quarter till 11 this morning, and John goes, Billy here? I said, no, so I guess you got a sermon to do. He just looked at me. Imagine deer in headlights. <laughs> now imagine deer in headlights sweating. <laughs> it wasn't fair, was it? Yeah. A couple weeks ago, Joanna, uh, on the 22nd, Joanna did her little talk about Christmas. Did everyone enjoy that? The origins of Christmas, and we can thank the Germans for a lot of things we do today, and the early Protestant church, and different ways, directions we went. If you open your Bibles now, we're going to go on and look at 1 Thessalonians. That's not going to work. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. We're going to go to verse 1 through 4. 
I'll be reading from a New King James version of the Bible. Oh, by the way, the little greeting thing. Did everyone enjoy that this morning? Amen. It's just nice. It gave me time to get everything arranged up here, so I figured I'll give you a minute to get everything going. So, but it works out nicely. It gives time to greet visitors at people we haven't seen for a while, and go from there. Am I not loud enough? Am I? Is that better? Okay, I'm sorry. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. Verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. You are not of the night or of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us, be, let us watch and be sober. And the great controversy, if you, if, you, if you study the book, it starts out, where does it start out? Where does the great controversy start out at? In heaven. And what's it talk about? So, this goes back to what we're talking about in Sabbath school right now. Origins. The beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's two parts to that verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, in the very beginning, He created the angels. He created heaven, and then all the worlds he created before us. But then it said, in the beginning, he created the heavens, and then down the road a piece, this earth. The great controversy takes the story from when sin began in heaven all the way to when? Now. Now. Until now. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Does everyone know what this is? It's the Indianapolis Star. Thursday, January 3rd. What's the big thing? Can anyone read that? What's it say there? So there's a question mark then. Save from the tax hike? Think again. Um, because of the way the laws are written, everyone that makes over $20,013 will get a 1.1% tax hike or more. And it's broken down here. Did that come as a little bit of a surprise, everybody? So everyone knew we were going to get a tax hike? What about this fiscal, fiscal cliff deal we just went through? Wasn't that supposed to uh, take care of all that? It was supposed to. So were we really ready for everyone getting a tax hike? Or did we only think those people making over $400,000 were going to get a tax hike? So you thought everyone was going to get one, huh? Only part. Only part? So, so see, we're not really sure what we thought. So, well, we probably will. Well, this new administration, it's not a new administration, it's a different administration. Same ones last time around, but they're changing people around. Regardless, it breaks down everything starting $297 all the way up to $14,812. And that's for the people making from $500,000 to a million dollars a year. Who said this morning to me, it was Doug or John, so what's $14,812 to uh, a millionaire? It's nothing. However, what's $297 to a person making $21,033? That's, you're right, that's almost a paycheck, so it's quite a bit. So who really, who got hurt the most in this tax hike? The little guy did. The guy at the bottom row got hurt the most. Huh? So, this kind of comes as a little bit surprised because of all the political haggling went on last year about, well, we're only going to get the big guy. 
but the little guy got affected the most. So this was kind of a surprise, right? As Christians, should anything really surprise us? What's the pastor say all the time? He says this a lot. If you're not being persecuted today, <laughs> what you, you say, Lori? You will be. Was that kind of like, maybe you will be, or it could happen? It's very definitive, isn't it? Now, a couple weeks ago, it was lesson 12. On the Sabbath afternoon, it says, the history of the great controversy between good and evil has many pivotal moments. The first, the climax, though was at the cross where Satan's ultimate defeat and destruction were ensured, there are other parts of it. That's the pivotal point. The next point, after the pivotal point, was Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected. Okay? The next point we come to is kind of where this church started in 1844. What period of time is that called? Huh? Well, that's... No, wait. When this church began, huh? There was a great disappointment. And what did that lead into? Investigative judgment. So what's taking place right now? Judgment. And where is that going on at? In heaven. It's taking place in heaven. And who's involved in this right now? Christ is. Do you know that investigative judgment is something that differentiates us from most other churches besides the Sabbath? Are, are you aware of that? Investigative judgment, what's taking place right now in heaven, is kind of something that's different. And where did we learn about that? And the great controversy. How many is that now? See, it's interesting. Well, the first one didn't count when I was talking about it. It's interesting because it is five. It's interesting because I told the children to do that. <laughs> anyway. I'm using this little thing, too, to help me today. You know, all the big speakers are doing that now. I saw, uh, didn't Van Hirsch use one of these, too? I think he did. I've seen several people use this, so I thought, well, we've got one in the house. I'm going to try that. It's not going to help any, is it? Anyway, with the investigative judgment, we're told that Christ right now is pleading our cases for those who have died before us and those today. Now, as we think about this, Let's think about some things we've seen in the news in the past few weeks. What was supposed to happen on the 21st of December last year? The what? End of the Mayan calendar, which many people consider to be the possible end of the world. Did it happen? Okay, we can scratch that one off, can't we? Okay. Newtown, Connecticut. Horrible. Horrible. What happened there? Several people got killed, right? How many children got killed? 20. How old were these kids? Okay. That was horrible, wasn't it? How many children died from secondhand smoke? Well, more than 20. I don't know about millions. How many children die every year because they're not in seatbelts? How many children die every year because of abuse? A lot. 
But let's just talk about the United States. There's a few that died in the United States, but let's just keep this in, in America. Why aren't we screaming and hollering and being all upset that people die for a sense of hunger, of not having seatbelts, of secondhand smoke, of cancer? Well, no, it's, it's the news media. It's a hype. We're going to have new gun laws so this type of thing doesn't happen again. Okay, there's going to be two different thoughts on this. You're talking about the Constitution. We talk about different things, about our rights, about protecting these people. Let's talk about Aurora, Colorado. What happened there? Same thing, only it wasn't just kids. It was a movie theater and a guy went nuts. Started shooting people. Henryville, Indiana. Tornado. Tornado. Superstorm Sandy. A hurricane with a nor'easter and a blizzard. All right. People die from that. Hurricanes. Are we talking about anything that we didn't know in advance? Aren't these things supposed to happen? Do we know these things are going to happen? How do we know that? The Bible tells us so. How else? The great controversy tells us so. Fiscal cliff. Every time we turn around, it looks like there's going to be just another drought or there's um, some catastrophe somewhere. Earth, the, the ministry in the earthly sanctuary taught that while the shedding of blood was necessary, Hebrews 9.22, to atone for sin, there was still the need for a priestly mediator between sinners and a holy God as a result of that bloodshed. Where we're at in history is where we're supposed to be at in history. I'm going to go to the great controversy. I'm going to go to page 329. Prophecy not only foretells the manner and object of Christ's coming, but presents tokens by which men are known when it is near. Jesus said there shall be, so that there shall be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. Luke 21, 25. The sun shall be darkened. The stars of heaven shall fall. And then in uh, Revelation 6, 12, there's a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. These signs were witnessed before the opening of the present century. In the fulfillment of this prophecy, there occurred in the year 1755, the most terrible earthquake that has ever been recorded. Where was that earthquake at in 1755? 1755? It was a great earthquake of Lisbon, Spain. And it says, Though commonly known as the earthquake of Lisbon, it extended to the greater part of Europe, Africa, and America. It was felt in Greenland, in the West Indies, in the Isle of Madeira, in Norway and Sweden, Great Britain and Ireland. It prevailed an extent of loss not less than 4 million square miles. <coughs> In Africa, the shock was almost as severe as in Europe. A great part of Algiers was destroyed. In a short distance from Morocco, a village containing eight or 10,000 inhabitants was swallowed up. A vast wave swept over the coast of Spain and Africa, engulfing cities and causing great destruction. At Lisbon, a sound of thunder was heard underground, and immediately after, a violent shock threw down the greater part of that city. In the course of about six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. The sea first retired and laid bar, the bar dry, and it rolled in, rising 50 feet above its ordinary level. The most extraordinary circumstances which occurred at Lisbon during the catastrophe was the subsistence of the new quay built entirely of marble. The shock of the earthquake was instantly followed by the fall of every church and covenant. 
Almost all the large and public buildings and one-fourth of the houses were destroyed. And about two hours afterwards, fires broke out in different parts of the city and raged for nearly three days. Unfortunately, many people ran to churches for te- protection, but in vain was the sacrament exposed. In vain did the poor creatures embrace the altars. Im- images, priests, and people were buried in one common ruin. 90,000 persons were supposed to have been lost on that fatal day. 25 years later appeared the great next sign, mentioned the prophecy, the darkening of the sun and the moon. And it was the dark day of May 19, 1870. So when we go to the book of Revelations, we start studying. When we go to the book of Matthew, Matthew 24, where it talks about these things, all these things happen as they're supposed to. Now let's go to the Great Controversy, page 356. Did anyone see the meteor shower the night, was it last, the night before last? There was a little meteor shower the night before last, and there was one a couple weeks ago. Yep. Did you see it? In 1833, two years after Miller began to present in the public the evidence of Christ soon coming, the last of the signs appeared which were promised by the Savior. The stars shall fall from heaven. On November 13, 1833, that was the most extensive and wonderful display of falling stars which ever occurred or had been recorded. The whole firmament over all the United States being then four hours in fiery commotion. No celestial phenomenon has ever occurred in this country since its first settlement, which was viewed with such intense admiration by one class in the community or such dread and alarm by another. From 2 o'clock until broad daylight, the sky, being perfectly serene and cloudless, was, instant, was an insistent, incessant play of dazzling brilliance, luminosities, and it was kept up in the whole heavens. When I started doing some research on that day, that they said that in New England, between 100 and 200,000 meteors per hour were visible between 100,000 and 200,000. Wouldn't that almost be like snow falling? It would be dazzling. All these things happened. And when did they happen? According to prophecy in the Bible. The Bible tells us these things are going to happen. And they have happened. So I guess my challenge to everyone is, What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Do our lives change? Has anything changed in your life recently? We've had droughts now three years in a row here in the Midwest. This past one was very, very significant. We lost 75% of the corn and I think 25% of the soybeans. If you look at the dollar, versus other currencies around the world, we're going down fairly fast. I read in the paper the other day that government motors, or General Motors, excuse me, General Motors is looking at like an $8 billion, $80 million, some, it's a great number, deficit here this, this, this next coming year. They're looking at a deficit. No matter what we try to do, our governments, our leaders, are they changing the direction the way the world's going? Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, their economies are all collapsing. 60,000 Syrians died this past week because of fighting within the country. 60,000 Syrians. That's a lot of people. As we go on with our daily lives here, there's a message that needs to be told to everybody. What is this message? Jesus is coming. He's your hope. He's already died for your sins. No matter what happens on this planet Earth, He's going to take care of you. He's going to fulfill your needs. The great controversy has us 
told fairly well. This is a condensation of that. This is like your Reader's Digest version of the, the Great Controversy. And if nothing else, we've got 2,000 of these. You have to get one of these and read it. Now, I don't want each family to take one home. Take one, read it, and then pass it on to your, your, your kids or whoever is interested in reading it. But I, I'm, I'm suggesting, at a, as a beginning, we read this. Happiness Digest. Does anyone know the other name for this book? Steps to Christ. If you haven't read that, I hope you would read that. This is a book we need to be reading on a daily basis. If you haven't read this, grab one and start at chapter 20. It'll get you up to date real quick. This church is, is, in, is in a very bad way. The Advent movement in this country is in a bad way. We're getting ready to have a health program presented by this church in February. We're having a meeting at lunchtime with the personal ministries and uh, we're going to be talking about having a health expo. We need people to help with this health expo. We need people to take vital signs and to fill different parts to register people. In the next coming weeks, we're going to be asking for volunteers. I'll be asking for volunteers, Teresa and uh, Teresa and Jackie will be kind of heading this up. We're at the end of time, folks. We can't waste time on the people in this church anymore. If you're not on board, get on board. This is going to help you get on board, doing some reading, doing some studying. It's going to take a corporate effort by this church to participate in this program. In a little over a year, Sean Boostra will be here presenting an evangelistic series to the city of Indianapolis. Indianapolis is going to be one of the beginning cities this is going to, happen, this is going to be happening in. If the things around you haven't alerted you and caused some alarm in your heart, the things in this Bible will. It's one thing to know about it because all the angels that have fallen from heaven know who Jesus Christ is. They know this book. But when Jesus comes back again, he's able to say, I did not know you. I think you would much rather he say, you were a good and faithful servant. Pastor Troxell has been preaching that he loves you and Jesus loves you. I'm going to reinforce that today by saying, I love you, the pastor loves you, and Jesus loves you. But the pastor and Dennis can't save you. Jesus can't save you unless you're willing to be saved. We cannot sit on the fence any longer. You either have to participate and be for Jesus, or if you sit on the fence and don't do anything, in essence, you're against Jesus. You have to, as an individual, pick a side you're going to be on. Whose side are you going to be on? At this point, this church, the Irvington, Irvington Seventh-day Adventist Church, is going into evangelistic mode. Our attention, our efforts, and our money are going to be enlightening people. The Ten Commandments, Jesus' love, His second coming, God is our creator, the Sabbath is a sign of His authority as the creator, as a sacrificial lamb, and as the day that He set aside, the time that He created for us to spend with Him. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we believe that Jesus is coming again and he's bringing his rewards with him. I would implore each and every individual in this room to begin studying your Sabbath school lesson. Children, you have to study your lessons as well. 
grab a copy of these books. If you have to go up to the um, ABC, then go up to the ABC. I don't know how many we have handy. We're going to be handing these out through the Health Expo, so we only have a limited number for the church members. The Great Controversy, we've been passing these out like wafers here for years. We've uh, passed out, how many did Teresa give out? 100? Maybe more? We've been passing these out for a long time. This, is, this, is, this book's been around for probably close to 100 years. As a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, I would hope that you know what you believe. And if you don't, I would hope that you begin finding out what you believe. We have lessons. But what we need to be doing now is reaching outside the confines of this group that we're talking to. And each of us needs to be reaching out to loved ones, family, and strangers. And telling them that Jesus loves you. Offering them words of encouragement and an opportunity to study with you. The small group Bible studies, we're starting those up again. We have um, Tuesday nights. We have Bible study here. We have to become participants. You can't sit on the sidelines anymore. That time's over. You have to be participants. Whatever we're doing on the Sabbath should be concentrating our efforts to get closer to Jesus Christ. Every one of us needs to be making efforts to draw people that we love and care about around us to Jesus. We're getting to the point where we're going to be talking to strangers. When we pray, Jesus will provide to us opportunities in our lives. Each week, someone's going to be coming along and we can help them. Let's go to the book of Romans now. Let's go to the book of Romans. 718. For I know that in me nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform is good what I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not do to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Do you understand what that's saying? I think Bill's point was, every day in our life, we purpose to do God's will. We purpose to do what's right, but oftentimes we fail doing that. We've got to stop failing, folks. We cannot continue in the same path. Einstein said that if we continue to do what we do and expect to get a different outcome, that is insanity. You can't do the same thing over and over and over again and expect a different outcome. You're going to get the same outcome. If you get up every morning and fail to open up your Bible, spend time with Jesus, and expect your heart to change, it's not going to happen. Each one of us, from the little kids here who need to be led by their family and parents, need to sit down and study their lesson. Make time for Jesus. God created time. He created the Sabbath, that 24-hour period of time. He created it. He made that day for him. The day does make a difference. He made a day for us to spend with him. We could have had a six-day cycle and done just fine. But he did nothing on the Sabbath day. He didn't do any creating. He didn't do any work that day. He made that day for us to spend with him. We have to spend time each and every day with God. Or when he comes back in the clouds and he's, each and one of us is going to stand before him, he's going to say, you were a good and faithful servant or I did not know you. 
If you don't spend time with Jesus in prayer and in study, how can he know you? You don't know him. That's where we're at, folks. Every one of us should be making preparations for his second return. Now, my father just passed away in April. We've lost other people in this church throughout the years. The day they died was the last day they had an opportunity to do anything in a relationship with Jesus. If you're sitting here today, at least for the moment, you are alive. And as long as you are alive and he gives you that breath to breathe, you have an opportunity to have a relationship with Jesus if you don't already have one. Don't say, I have a relationship with God, and that you don't talk to him and study with him, because you don't. It's an imaginary thing you have in your mind. It's a lie that Satan's telling you to, you know, you have a relationship with God because you come to church. No. You have a relationship with God when you spend time with him, when you talk to him, when you listen to him, and when you do his bidding. This church is prepared corporately to begin doing his bidding. We've made attempts in the past, and I think at this point in time, our path looks like it's in the health field with the health expos. We have to do whatever it takes to provide an opportunity for people to come to this church, to come to this truth, to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and who he is. And I would implore each and every person in this room, child, adult, whomever, to start making specific time each and every day to know Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, each of us have choices to make. We pray that the Holy Spirit was in the sanctuary today, that we all might receive that special message that you have for us. Father, the words that I spoke, I pray that they came from you. Regardless of what I said, Father, I would pray right now that the Holy Spirit made those words and planned them into the minds of people in the sanctuary as you wanted them interpreted, Father. I don't know anyone's heart, but you do. And I would pray today that each person here would make it and propose it, purpose it in their heart that they would give their lives.